welcome back. I am Dr. Jennifer Mata. Today's video is going to be about multicultural education. In the video, I'm going to share with you some of the inequalities that we have currently in the U.S. in terms of educating diverse populations that exist for culturally and linguistically diverse students, or as some call them, English language learners, or dual language learners, or second language learners. So all of these acronyms are used for this population. I'm also going to talk about what we could do in order to best serve this population of students that have both a diverse cultural and linguistic background. Multicultural education, though, is not just for this particular population, but for any population that has a very diverse ethnical composition. And when I talk about a population, I'm talking about a, a classroom population. So the video is going to touch upon how to best develop curriculum to address diversity in a multicultural approach to education. Also, I'm going to share with you some of the models that exist that have been put into practice in order to facilitate multicultural education for young learners. The audience for this video is going to be teachers, teacher educators, curriculum designers, and parents who might be homeschooling their children. Anybody that wants to provide early learners with an enriched, diverse learning experience so that they can combat some of the biases and stereotypes that we have currently in our society. Let's get into it. So currently in the US, if we scan our educational field, we're going to find that there are some opportunities and resources for our culturally and linguistically diverse students that are not as equitable as those that are offered for other populations in our public schools. One of the things we find because of these inequitable opportunities and resources is that we compensate for with remedial education and tracking for our culturally and linguistically diverse students. We see that there's an overrepresentation of these students in special education. We see that they tend to be excluded from gifted and talented programs and adva advanced placement courses. And that we see that there is a lack of instructional materials and access to technology for bilingual and bicultural education that might be provided for these students. In terms of the schools, we see that there's inequitable funding for the schools in which we typically find these students. And then they have poor facilities and the quality of the resources in the facilities is not up to par. There are also inequitable access to quality educators because we find that the educators that are hired and that work in these poor quality facilities schools are not the best trained ones. So if we're looking at a social, social justice approach, and when we're talking about social justice, we're talking about appropriate distribution of benefits and burdens among groups based on principles of human rights and equality. So we're talking about basic human rights and within social justice. So if we want to provide equity for our culturally and linguistically diverse students, we need to come to it from a social justice lens or approach. We need to provide these basic human rights for this particular population. We also need to provide basic linguistic rights. And individuals have rights on their own. So they have a right as an individual to identify with their own language and use it both in and out of school uh, premises. And they also have the right to learn the official language at a proficiency level that is going to help them be competent and successful in life. The communities also have linguistic rights. So they have the right to continue to learn and develop and maintain their language in their schools and look after their uh, curricula. And so they have rights over the institutions that are part of their community. 
Another thing that would provide equity for culturally linguistic and diverse students is to design creative and challenging curricula for these students. Creative and challenging curricula is going to help them not only gain the proficiency in the dominant language or in English, but is also going to help them give them the knowledge skills and uh, content-based skills that is that are going to help them succeed later on once they graduate out of school. A third component that is going to allow us to remedy the, the inequality or strive for equity for culturally and linguistically diverse students is to offer a transformative intercultural pedagogy as well as a culturally relevant pedagogy. So a transformative intercultural pedagogy is one in which students' language and cognitive abilities are included in the learning process and students' identities are affirmed. So it's a, a pedagogy that is based on the student's strengths but builds upon these strengths both in the language domain as well as the cognitive ability domain. The culturally relevant pedagogy besides aligning curriculum with students' languages and home cultures, attempts to counteract the inequitable power relationships in society and empower minority students to develop their literacy and agency to work against oppression. So a culturally relevant pedagogy is going to empower students to stand up for themselves and advocate for themselves against the status quo. I recently saw an exercise on making hidden privilege visible for those who have it. I'm going to link it below because I think it's going to be a really interesting uh, exercise that teachers could use with their students. So in summary, what is needed in the U.S. for educating in an equitable fashion culturally and linguistically diverse students? Well, one of the things we need is a challenging, inclusive curriculum that starts early so that it doesn't necessarily wait until these students have gained English proficiency, but that challenges them with the adequate content for their grade level from the get-go. The second thing we need is to prepare caring and creative and qualified educators to work with culturally and linguistically diverse students. Typically, we stem or we, we gain these educators from the community. So they're community members that can identify because with the students because they have the same culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds themselves. But this is not enough. We need to train teachers that don't necessarily come from these communities to be able to empathize with these community members and with these students that they're going to have in their classrooms, particularly when we're talking about metropolis and urban settings that have a very, very diverse population. So how do we accomplish this training of teachers, sensitivity, and creating this curriculum that is challenging for all students? Well, the answer is through multicultural education. Multicultural education is based on the premise that all students, despite their backgrounds, be it culturally or linguistically diverse, should have equal educational opportunities, equal opportunities to an education that is both enriched and challenging for them. This premise then sustains that there's a need to review and transform the curriculum because we know that education is enacted in the classroom through the curriculum that is designed and provided by the teachers. So there's a need to review and transform this curriculum to incorporate cultural diversity into it, to be able to address all the different backgrounds of the population of students that we have in the classroom. So how do we do this is the question now. How do we transform the curriculum through a multicultural approach? Well, a multicultural curriculum is going to stem from a careful analysis of the needs and characteristics of both the individuals or the children that we're working with and their families. But it's also going to place a particular attention 
to the culture and societal needs of the community in which the school is embedded. So teachers are going to be instrumental in the process of creating and designing the culturally responsive curriculum. There are four major aspects to be taken into account or that should be illustrated or embedded into a multicultural curriculum. One is opportunities for children to learn about themselves and their own heritage, so their own cultural background. Two is going to be to provide through the curriculum classroom interactions with peers and adults with diverse characteristics. So you have to have a very diverse population in your classroom and in your school in order to uh, provide this for children. Three, the curriculum is going to provide meaningful learning about cultures and diversity issues. So meaningful in-depth learning issues that have to do with racism, issues that have to do with disparities, with biases, with stereotypes. Those are the kinds of topics that you want to open up to discussion in a multicultural curriculum. And fourth, you want to provide through the curriculum challenging and meaningful experiences to promote knowledge of their own cultures, their peers' cultures, and the environment's culture. So you're bringing in all the different cultural backgrounds that are coming into play into the curriculum and providing opportunities for children to learn about um, all of these backgrounds. So because multicultural education has been around for a while, we do not have to reinvent the wheel when we talk about models of how to best implement it. There are some models that we can look back on and see what they propose and how they work and how they incorporate multicultural education into the curriculum and into the educative experiences. So there are two types of models. There are deductive models and there are inductive models. So the deductive models are those that work from a more general approach to the specific. Sometimes they're informally called top-down approaches and they go from theory to application or confirmation. And we have two, the Louise German Sparks anti-bias curriculum approach that comes from theory and then it has sort of a how-to to implement it into practice. And then the Head Start program, which is a federal funded program, and we'll go into it a little bit, that has a multicultural education approach to it. And it was conceived theoretically as such, but has been implemented in the U.S. since um, the 60s. Uh, it was uh, conceived as a multicultural education approach in the 90s. And since then, that's the way it has been operating. The other types of models are inductive models and these models their reasoning works in the opposite way so they move from specific observations to broader generalizations and theories so they're developed through the analysis of practice or experience experiences that have been observed and then from practical scenarios that have worked a theory then has been developed in order to help generalize it to other practical scenarios. And in this category, we have the James Banks levels of integration approach, and then we have the Sleater and Grant, or the Christine Sleater and Carl Grant typology for addressing human diversity. So let's look at the first inductive model offered by James Banks. And he talks about levels of integration of multicultural content into the curriculum. He talks about four levels of curriculum complexity. And it starts at the bottom with level one. It's the least cumbersome or the least integral way to introduce multicultural content into the curriculum. And he calls this level one the contributions approach. In this approach, or in this level of integration, the curriculum remains the same, but it's enhanced by including activities that have to do with holidays or they highlight some certain heroes or certain uh, dates that are important for a particular culture. And, and that's it. The curriculum doesn't really change, but there's certain days or certain uh, holidays that are 
celebrated, uh, explained, studied with the children. So the purpose here is just to recognize contributions of other cultural groups that might be represented by the children that compose the population of the classroom. The second level of integration is the additive approach. Here, the curriculum also remains the same, but includes selected cultural themes. So a theme or a unit could be included into the curriculum, could be added into the existing curriculum to study a particular cultural group. The third level is the transformative or the transformation approach. And in this level, the curriculum is completely developed around a theme and a concept related to targeted cultural groups. So children are going to examine a variety of issues from the perspectives of different cultural groups and they're going to be integrated into the curriculum because the curriculum has been redesigned to study these particular culture groups. When we talk about targeted culture groups, we're talking about those cultural groups that are represented in the classroom, that are represented in the student population. The fourth level of integration, which is the most in-depth level, is the social action approach. The curriculum here is completely revamped and redesigned and it's purposefully developed to allow children to ponder and take action in a variety of social issues that are related to diversity and they address their particular issues uh, regarding their background, culturally and linguistically diverse background. This model is one of my favorite models because it is very inclusive in the sense that even if you are at level one on a contributions approach level of integration, you're still contributing to a multicultural experience and a multicultural education for the children that you serve and teach. So I think that this model embracing this at any level of uh, comfort that the teacher might have is going to provide the beginning steps to providing multicultural content uh, for the students. So the second inductive model that we have is the Sleater and Grant topology for multicultural education. And they propose five approaches into looking at or redesigning the curriculum to incorporate multicultural education. The first approach is teaching the exceptional and the culturally different. So they propose that in doing so, we need to incorporate into the curriculum meaningful content and language needs. We also need to look at the instructional process and we need to look at the program structure and parent involvement is also going to be crucial to uh, incorporating multicultural education under this proposed approach. Another approach is to work with themes, particularly human relations into the curriculum. So looking at aspects that have to do with human relationships or relations and create themes around which children are going to study and explore and learn. The third approach proposed by Sleater and Grant is the single group study. So here they're focusing just on one group or one element of study and going in depth into learning about this group. The fourth approach is just multicultural education, which is a comprehensive curriculum redesigned to include in all aspects of the curriculum a multicultural approach to learning. The fifth approach is an education overall that is multicultural and socially geared towards reconstruction. So it is, uh, the, the main goal is to achieve equality and to eliminate oppression in the society. So we see that Sleater and Grant's topology has some similarities to Banks levels of integration. And um, either of them is gonna guide us into either incorporating some aspects of multicultural education into the curriculum or completely revamping and redesigning the curriculum and the edu educational process to embrace a multicultural approach. The German Sparks anti-bias approach is one of the deductive models that we have. It was firstly conceived as a proposed curriculum in 1989, 
but more recently in 2010, it was proposed as an overall approach to education, in which the teacher designs the curriculum with her particular students in mind and is not offered as a set prescribed curriculum to follow. So the approach centers on changing existing social inequalities and proposes eliminating sources of stereotype that lead individuals to develop prejudice and cultural biases. The teacher then develops the curriculum from her particular children's cultural realities, experiences, behaviors, and interests, the families that she's working with, interests, beliefs, and concerns for their children, and the social events, messages, and realities that surround the children in their community and society but also takes into account the teacher's knowledge, beliefs, and values, since the teacher is the one that is developing the overall curriculum to be enacted. So the anti-bias approach offers us some guidelines for avoiding a tourist approach, or a tourist-like approach, to the curriculum by doing the following. One, connecting cultural activities to the individual children and their families, the, in, the children that we actually have in our classroom. Two, remembering that although cultural patterns and are real and they affect all members of an ethnic group, families and children are gonna live their culture in their own very particular individual ways. Three, we want to connect cultural activities to concrete daily lives and we want to explore cultural diversity within the principle that everyone has a culture because sometimes especially with our own culture we seem to be um, immune to it we seem to not necessarily notice it we it seems a little bit invisible to us because we're so embedded in it also the fifth guideline is to have cultural diversity permeate the daily life of the classroom through frequent and concrete hands-on experiences that are related to the children's interests. So have that regardless of what level of integration, for example, or what um, topology we're using to embed multicultural education into our curriculum, have a lot of hands-on hands -on experiences that, through which children can experience uh, cultural diversity. An another guideline is to avoid the editorial we when talking to children because it implies that we are all the same and it highlights sameness when in reality we are a very diverse group with, uh, with um, a lot of differences that need to be studied and explored. Seven, explore the similarities among group of people through their differences, and this ties uh, nicely with uh, guideline number six. And lastly, begin with the cultural diversity among the children and the staff in your classroom, in your school, in your community, and then focus on the diversity of others outside the learning community. So lastly, Head Start is the last deductive model to multicultural education we will talk about. It was proposed in the 60s as a theoretical model for educating the less advantaged, impoverished, and in need populations through wraparound services that included young children's education, health, and parental education as well. This model was then put into practice through a federal grant that still holds to this day across the U.S. in all 50 states. Head Start was revised in the 90s and then again in 2010 to include a multicultural approach to their programming. And here are some of the principles that support this approach. We see here 10 guiding principles to incorporate a framework of multicultural education into Head Start services and programs. We see that culture is highlighted in most all of these principles. Culture coming from the particular individuals and families that the Head Start program is working with, culture and coming from the teachers that provide the curriculum and that enact the, the teaching and learning process, and culture that is also reflected in the community in which the Head Start program is embedded.
Interesting to note in a program like Head Start is that because it's conceived as a wraparound service to not only the children, but the families and the overall community, is that there is a call for examining and challenging institutional and personal biases across the board. So the teachers are not only called to design curriculum to try to tackle the uh, biases and stereotypes that exist, but also are called to examine their own. The only way that a culturally relevant and diverse programming can be offered throughout the services that Head Start provides to families is to have each and every individual within this program be a culturally sensitive, alert, and responsible member of this program. So that is all for now. Thank you for viewing and I hope you found it useful and educative and I hope you come back for more videos in the future. Subscribe if you haven't already and you'll get notified of when new videos are published. See you soon. Bye.